Um, and today I'll be telling you about um, the research, well, uh, collaboration project we had with uh, Rigeti Computing uh, regarding implementing uh, optimization use cases in state-of-the-art quantum devices. Um, all of the stuff I'm going to be telling you about today, you can find it uh, in our Medium channel, um, the Entropic Labs one. Uh, the blog post name is the same as the one as the title of the stock. Um, so if you miss anything here, you can ask me later in Discord, or you can find all the info there. So um, yeah, let me tell you about this project. Basically, uh, the goal that we had in mind was to explore the capabilities of today's quantum computers to tackle relevant optimization problems. So we took this statement uh, rather broadly and with a lot of freedom, and, and we actually decided to pick a very simple problem, uh, hard problem, but actually simple to, uh, to parameterize, uh, which corresponds to finding the minimum vertex cover of a graph. We actually were able to relate this problem to um, real-world uh, situations, and we were able to extract our real data sets from three different areas, namely water distribution networks, synthetic biology, and cryptocurrency evolution. We um, attacked this problem, uh, making use of, a general, of um, an extension of the quantum approximate optimization algorithm, uh, QAOA, namely recursive QA, and we actually developed a generalization of this algorithm to uh, run our experiments in a less intensive way on the quantum computer. And finally, uh, I think one of the most interesting parts for us was actually build uh, a full pipeline uh, from the actual chatted data sets until uh, the circuit that we actually needed to run on the quantum computer. Um, and for this project, we used the Aspen M2 uh, device provided by Rigetti, uh, which you can see at the bottom left, um, which corresponds to an 80 qubit device. And it's a combination of different octagon geometries uh, in the way that you see there. But this is more like, um, let's say, the technical structure of what the project was. Um, but in reality, the spirit of the story for us was really learning how to use a true uh, NISC device. So by true, I mean true intermediate scale in that uh, we're moving beyond the 8 qubit or 16 qubit uh, devices in which we can still simulate the entire thing on our laptops, that we're really sort of like entering uh, a realm in which uh, the scale is so big that we don't have the access with our simulations, but the noise is still present. So how we can go about doing all this while exploiting the interesting properties for our own quantum algorithms. Now, so that's what it was for us, uh, but for you, um, hopefully like the spirit of this talk is that I give you a walkthrough of this process, how it was for us. And on top of that, you get to learn a little bit of what the minimum of discover problem is, which I'll refer to as MBC uh, for short. And I'll show you a little bit of the recursive uh, QA algorithm in case you've never heard of it. Um, you'll get a little bit more acquainted with it. So the menu for today is that we're going to review what the MVC problem is. We'll connect it with one of the applications that we had in mind. Um, we'll discuss the algorithms that we use, QA and recursive QA. We'll discuss how to implement the circuits uh, on the actual QPU. And then finally, we'll close it off with some of the experimental results that we obtain uh, from running uh, these things on the hardware. So first things first, um, finding the minimum vertex cover uh, of a graph corresponds to finding the smallest uh, set of nodes such that every edge in the graph is incident uh, in one of them. So to clarify what I mean, here I have an example of a star graph. Uh, in each of these four uh, examples, I've drawn in orange uh, a vertex cover on this graph. So as you can see in each one of these examples, every edge of the graph is incident in at least one of the orange nodes meaning that they're all vertex covers. But what we're interested in is finding the one that it's minimal in size, which should really here corresponds to the one on the left. This is a very easy example, uh, but I think it's very clear on what we mean by MBC. Um, and there's many others. Uh, in fact, the fully connected problem is actually trivial as well, where uh, the MBC corresponds to uh, all the nodes except for one, and it's N degenerate. Um, you can take the case of a ring uh, where you have two different solutions corresponding to alternating between nodes belonging and outside to the cover. And on the right, what you see, it's actually the MBC of the Aspen M2 qubit topology, where all the defects that you see on this graph corresponds to the edges on which we cannot apply the specific um, gates that we need uh, to use uh, to implement our, our QIA circuits. So while these examples are actually quite easy, it turns out that this problem is in general NP-HAR. Uh, you can convince yourself you consider a three or four regular graph that is actually quite big, and you'll see that it's actually not easy at all to find uh, what the minimum vertex cover of such an instance is. 
So generically, even though the formulation uh, or conceptually is rather simple, it's actually a very complicated problem. So it turns out that we can uh, recast uh, this problem as an optimization task um, given by a certain cost function uh, of cubo form that you can see here. So we're, uh, uh, we're left with the task of having to uh, minimize this cost function. And we are now assigning uh, a binary variable to each one uh, of the nodes, uh, where when this variable is equal to zero, that means that the node is outside of the cover. When it's equal to one, that means that it is inside of the cover. So let me say more about this cost function. Uh, the first term that you see uh, corresponds to a cost uh, that we pay for adding nodes to a cover, meaning that this term will try to ensure that the cover we're building is as small as possible. The second one, uh, it's a penalty term, uh, which um, provides a penalty cost for uh, every edge that is missing in the cover that we're building. So note that there's uh, three different ways of covering an edge, namely putting two nodes around the edge or choosing either one of the nodes around it. That's why you have two factors in this term. So it's a very simple cost function. First term, trying to minimize the cover. Second term, uh, ensuring that the uh, structure that we're building is actually a cover on the graph. Um, this is a classical cost function, but of course we're interested in quantum computing here. So uh, we actually need uh, to map this cost function into a cost Hamiltonian. Uh, we can easily do so by mapping our binary variables into uh, Z Pauli uh, matrices. However, you can see that even though I've swapped the terms, uh, actually um, the structure is pretty much the same. And now we interpret um, the states uh, of our problem being that uh, a qubit belong um, to the cover when it's pointing down and it's outside of the cover when it's pointing up. So showing both the cost Hamiltonian and the cost function actually uh, allows me to point that um, minimum vertex cover is actually really nice because you have very few parameters in order to uh, to define your problem. These are two parameters that are not given by the by the instance that we want to solve. These are things that we fix. So we actually, if we consider the ratio in total, it's actually just one parameter that we need to set. And additionally, note that the specific structure uh, of the problem instance is actually the structure that is reflected on the cost function and on the Hamiltonian, being that specific set of edges that are present on the graph um, that we want to find the minimum vertex cover on correspond to the connectivity uh, that it's present overall in the cost Hamiltonian that we need to solve later. So there's no need to add uh, extra slack variables or uh, create uh, extra connections in this graph. It's literally uh, a one-to-one -one mapping in that sense. So now that we have uh, established what the minimum vertex cover is, um, we find a way to recast it as an optimization problem through this cost function and uh, through this quantum Hamiltonian. Let me tell you uh, a bit more about how this problem maps on two, two other very interesting problems. So the first one corresponds to the maximum independent set, uh, which I also refer to as MIS. So the maximum independent set of a graph corresponds to uh, the largest subset of nodes such that all of these are disconnected, uh, which is in this case, are uh, the general in blue. And as you can see, it's uh, trivially related with the minimum vertex cover in that it's actually the complementary set of the MBC. Meaning that if I get a graph, I compute the minimum vertex cover and I remove it from it, what I'm left with is exactly the MIS. Now, uh, the next one, and maybe it's a little bit less straightforward to see and correspond to finding the maximum click of a graph. The maximum click is defined as the largest uh, subset of the graph that it's fully connected. And it turns out um, that we can, com uh, we can obtain it from the other two problems by computing the complementary graph. Now on this complementary graph, which is something efficient to compute from the original one, uh, all we need to do is find uh, the maximum independent set, and there's a one-to-one -one mapping between this set and the maximum click on the original graph. So in the end, uh, by computing the minimum vertex cover, I can either retrieve the maximum independent set or the maximum click on my graph um, by computing the complementary graph. Um, this actually opens the door uh, to exploring um, more interesting applications as, as many different problems in the real world manifest as uh, different instances of each one of these three. But in the end, we always keep uh, in mind that we want to do is solve MVC. So now I'm gonna give you um, one example of each one of these, which are the applications uh, that, we, that we chose. So let's get started with the first one, um, which is water distribution networks. So we can, um, so water distribution network, think of it as loads of uh, pipes that are joined at certain places and you have water flowing through them. And these can easily be mapped as graphs. Um, so the idea is that we want to place sensor, uh, sensors on the nodes of this graph, such that we can monitor the entirety of the network. 
but we can do so trying to save as much money as possible, meaning that we place uh, the least, the minimal number of uh, sensors as possible, but in a way that we actually uh, monitor the entirety of the network. And as you can already guess, uh, this trivially is a minimal vertex cover problem, in which case, if you take this example as a network, right, if I place my sensors uh, at the NBC nodes, I know that I, I'm surveying uh, the entirety of the network, and I know that I cannot reduce the number of sessions that I place anymore. So in this case, I literally need to solve just an NBC problem. Uh, so simple. Um, the next one, uh, maybe just a uh, step up in difficulty, corresponds to a problem inspired from synthetic biology, in which we're giving a set of strings. You can think of these as DNA parts. And we're given the task of finding uh, the maximal set of these strings that contains uh, no repeating sequences longer than some specific value L max. Um, so this can actually map into a graph problem by mapping each one of the strings in the set into a node and drawing edges between these two nodes whenever um, the repetitions between the strings are larger uh, than the specific uh, length L max. This also applies uh, to nodes where whenever we have sub repetitions, uh, we can draw sub loops in a specific node. So as you can, again, already guess, this is nothing but uh, the maximum dependent set, where the maximal set containing the repeating sequences uh, is the MIS on the graph that we're constructing. Just to make things more transparent, here I made an example uh, where I have six different strings. I map this into a node, and I draw edges between them whenever there's a repetition uh, longer than, in this case, L max equals 2. So all I need to do is find my MVC. I just remove it, and then I'm left uh, with a maximum independent set, which corresponds uh, to the maximal set of strings that contains no repeating sequences longer, in this case, than two. Again, uh, we use MBC, uh, we obtain MIS, and there we go, the solution to our problem. And the last one uh, corresponds to portfolio optimization. Now, I know this is a very complicated problem and there's many aspects to it, uh, but we've just sort of approached it from a very simplistic point of view. And the, the idea is that given uh, the evolution of a set of stocks, uh, what we want to do is find the maximal amount of uh, most correlated ones or maybe anti-correlated stock evolutions. Now, uh, to map this into an MVC problem, we can make use of a, a well-known tool uh, called the market graph, which is a mapping between each one of the stock evolutions into a set of nodes. And then we draw edges between these nodes whenever um, the correlation between the stocks over a certain period of time is larger than a certain threshold theta. Now, setting the value of theta uh, between minus one and one is something that we do manually. And depending on whether maybe we make it uh, negative or positive, we'll be looking at different properties uh, or different statistics that we want to extract from the market graph. But in our case, we're going to pretend that this value is positive. And actually, we're going to be searching for the maximal set of uh, possibly correlated stocks, which is nothing but the maximum click of the market graph. Uh, now, here I have uh, one example where all the numbers are completely fake. <laughs> this is all just for pictorial purposes. Um, where I've just wanted to make it graphical. That's why I added uh, the logos here, but of course there's no real information whatsoever here. So in this case, um, the maximal amount of possibly correlated um, um, cryptocurrencies in this case corresponds to the maximal click, which is uh, the three nodes that you have on the left. So yeah, uh, that's it. Um, now you know what the minimum vertex uh, cover problem is. Uh, we'll discuss a few applications using the mapping between MBC, MIS, and MC. And at this point, um, we're ready to discuss how we're going to approach this problem. And for that, uh, I'll give you a quick refresher of what the quantum approximate optimization algorithm, QA for short, actually is. So this algorithm is a variational algorithm uh, defined through the so called QA ansatz psi, uh, which corresponds to applying a set of layers on an initial state. And each one of these layers is composed of two different unitaries, which correspond to the evolution under the cost Hamiltonian uh, for a certain period of time gamma and the evolution under some mixture Hamiltonian uh, during a period of time beta. So each uh, gamma and beta were actually variational parameters. Uh, there's one of them per layer, meaning that it's a total of two P parameters. So since this is a variational algorithm, what we want is to find the specific values of beta and gamma that actually uh, minimize the expectation value for a cost Hamiltonian, meaning that we're getting as close as possible uh, to the ground state of the Hamiltonian, which encodes uh, the solution to our optimization problem. So for a mixture, we're going to use a very standard choice for this algorithm, which corresponds to just a set of X operators. And for the cost Hamiltonian, we just have the, the MBC Hamiltonian that we discussed in the previous slides. 
So uh, let me actually uh, show you a bit more uh, clearly what the state side looks like. So we initialize our states in the plus states, which can be done through a set of uh, Hadamard gates, which are not shown here. But here in the blocks, what you can see is um, the effect of each one of the different layers in the ansatz, where in each layer you have uh, your gamma angles and your beta angles. You can see that the gamma ones uh, correspond to uh, Z set gates and um, Z rotations. Uh, corresponding to the linear and the quadratic terms in the fast Hamiltonian. And after that, we have a set of uh, X rotations corresponding to the effect of the mixer Hamiltonian. Um, here you can see, yeah, again, each one of the um, blocks associated with the layers. But something that I really wanted to hint at here that I think is really important, and it's somewhat something special about the QA ansatz, is that, is that this state actually contains uh, the co Hamiltonian its definition, uh, which is maybe a particularity of this algorithm. This means that the specific um, connectivity that's present in our cost Hamiltonian is going to have a straight impact on how we want to build our circuit. Uh, and if you roll it back to what we were discussing at the beginning, uh, this is actually the connectivity of the uh, problem instance on, we would, on which we want to find the minimum vertex cover. So this connectivity defines the connectivity of our cost Hamiltonian, which in turn uh, defines the specific structure of the kind of circuit that we want to build on our quantum computer. So there's a direct connection there, problem instance, uh, quantum circuit. Uh, and that is, and that has to do, uh, so the reason for that is uh, having the cost Hamiltonian uh, being part of your, uh, having your cost Hamiltonian being part of the definition of the QA ansatzes. Um, yes, that's what I wanted to let you know. Okay, but now that I've told you what um, the state is, let me tell you how the uh, algorithm works. Basically, what we do is uh, we prepare our step psi on the hardware. Uh, then we measure the state, obtain some probability distribution. Using it, we can compute the expectation value of the cost Hamiltonian. And then we pass this value onto a classical optimizer strategy, which will update our variation parameters uh, so that we can uh, move in the, in the, in the landscape of, of parameters and obtain uh, some better estimation. Uh, and again, we update these parameters, we feed them back into the quantum state, uh, we compute the expectation value, and this goes on and on. This interplay between classical and quantum resources usually uh, referred to as um, hybrid quantum classical loop, and it keeps on going until we find a set of parameters that converges to some uh, optimal uh, expectation value. So the output of QA is some state uh, psi, so some probability distribution uh, based on the optimized angles, and then some specific cost um, which corresponds to the expectation value of the Hamiltonian um, at the optimized angles, which we can use. Uh, we can use this cost value to actually um, understand how good or bad uh, our algorithm has performed. Okay, uh, so now that we are on good foot on what concerns QA, let me tell you about recursive QA. So this strategy was developed um, a few years down the line, and it basically consists on applying QA recursively and using the output of QA to reduce the number of variables of our problem at each step. And we do so until the problem is so small that it can be solved exactly. So let me tell you how this works. Basically, with our QA output, which we saw before, uh, corresponds to the probability distribution. Now, from this probability distribution, we compute all the expectation values of the terms present Hamiltonian, which can be either single qubit expectation values or correlation between two different qubits. And crucially, what RQA does is considers the ones that is highest magnitude among all these statistical quantities and imposes it as a constraint on the problem. Remember that when we have a problem with a certain number of variables, when we impose constraints on them, we're effectively reducing the number of variables that define our problem. And in this case, these constraints can come in two different flavors. Namely, if uh, it is a correlation, what is maximal? That corresponds to uh, your qubits being either aligned or anti-aligned, depending on the sign of the correlation, or if it's a um, single qubit expectation value corresponds to the spin either pointing up or down. Now, geometrically, um, we can understand this as having some graph of a certain size n that is larger than the cutoff that we set. Uh, and then what we do is we run QA on it. Uh, we compute all the expectation values, consider the one that is maximal, and then we have two different cases. If the maximal one corresponds to a single qubit expectation value, what we're doing is fixing uh, one of the qubits, again, one of the nodes in the graph, and they're effectively removing it along with all the edges that are actually connected to it. So what we're doing is removing a variable and making the instance locally sparser. Now, on the other hand, uh, if it is uh, a correlation, what we're doing effectively is fusing uh, the two nodes. 
And in this case, Node J uh, inherits all the edges coming from, from Node I, uh, which reduces, again, the size of the instance, but it makes it locally denser. Now, importantly, a priori, you will not know um, which kind of constraint you'll have to impose, and you will know where you'll have to impose it as well. So this results in the topology of your problem actually changing unpredictably. Uh, but um, even though you have to be ready for this, the good part is that you're actually reducing the test of the problem. So after you make an elimination, what you do is run QA again, uh, select your statistical quantity, perform your elimination, and so on and so on, until uh, you reach a system size that is small enough so that you can fold this by brute force counting. And then what you do is reconstruct the final solution uh, by uh, uh, reinserting all the qubits that you eliminated with your constraints. Now, an interesting difference between QA and recursive QA is that RQA actually spits a set of strings as your approximate solutions, whereas QA actually depends on a whole set of distribution among different states. Uh, this is actually a very important difference that, uh, that we'll uh, make a point on later. But yeah, uh, that's it. Uh, that's pretty much all I wanted to see on algorithms, except for one last detail. Uh, which has to do with the generalization uh, that we devised on top of this algorithm, uh, which we denote as adaptive RQA. And basically, um, this procedure, just it works, corresponds to uh, following a statistical criterion to select multiple expectation values, which enables us to make multiple eliminations, which makes the whole process faster. And we found in our studies that it actually can uh, perform quite comparable to eliminating uh, just one qubit at a time as the standard strategy for RQA goes. This is actually very important when you're running things on a quantum computer, right? Because you're limited uh, to a budget and you have, uh, the resources are really expensive in terms of money, in terms of time. So you want to go as fast as possible and actually using uh, this generalization open the doors for us to perform loads of interesting experiments. So yeah, that's all I wanted to say about algorithms. And at this point, uh, I've already told you about what is the problem that I want to solve in BC. I've told you how we want to approach it, namely recursive QA, so you know what kind of uh, circuits are the ones that we're going to be implementing on them. Um, so we're almost ready to actually go ahead and running our experiments. However, when you're actually confronted with uh, the QPU, now you need to make a few decisions which become crucial uh, for the success of your implementation. And these are, first of all, what qubits to use. If I want to implement an eight qubit instance, what chunk of my device should I actually choose? Uh, and then how to deal with the lack of matching topology. As we said before, uh, the geometry of the problem instance will determine the specific characteristics of your circuit. And as you can already guess, any generic instance uh, will rarely ever look like something you have already embedded on your quantum device. Uh, so most likely uh, you'll need to make some rearrangement because of this uh, mismatching geometry. And you gotta be careful how to do it. So. On top of that, so we need to address these two questions uh, in an optimal way, such that the overall circuit that we build is actually um, using our quantum resources in the best possible way, maximizing fidelities and trying to reduce the depth of our circuit as much as possible in order to get uh, the best results out of our QPU. So answering this question actually follows, uh, actually, yeah, follows under the umbrella of what we refer to as circuit compilation. And what I'm going to tell you right now is actually how we uh, went about uh, solving these issues. So giving us a problem instance on which we want to find our MBC, uh, the first thing they're going to do is select your qubits. Uh, for that, we develop a procedure that uses similarity annealing, uh, in which it chooses um, all the subgraphs in the, in, the, in the chip that can host uh, the instance that we want to solve, and then selects the one that uh, minimizes the subgraph diameter and maximizes uh, the fidelity of the two qubits that one needs to apply on this, on this instance. In this case, I've randomly chosen the one on the bottom left. So let's say we go for this set of qubits in the shape of the ring. And then the next part is having to account um, for all the edges that are present in the instance but are not present in the hardware. Uh, this problem is referred to as QB routing, in which uh, we actually generate this connection by placing swaps on a circuit. And that's a way of connecting qubits that are distanced in the hardware by passing uh, from one qubit to another the state of the qubit that needs to be connected onto the one uh, that we're interested in making them interact. Now, uh, in order to optimize the number of stops that we use, uh, we also implemented uh, a simulating annealing procedure, and that enables us to try to make the best possible choice in terms of arranging swaps and making our connections um, uh, in the best possible way such that we minimize the circuit depth, which is really the most important part here. So 
finally, the very last step has to do with trying to parallelize a problem as much as possible. So basically, we have a set of gates, and then we can you can sort of start parallelizing them by accounting for the commutation rules. And also, very importantly, uh, we need to unfence uh, the gates in, in our circuit. Uh, this is done using Rigetti's uh, pulse level tools. Um, and fencing here, um, let me explain a bit more on that. Fencing corresponds to, let you can think of it of as being unable to actually parallelize uh, um, the gates. And the reason for this, 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 this barrier comes about from trying to avoid the excessive, an excessive amount of crosstalk when trying to um, uh, implement many uh, cubic gates at the same time. In our case, uh, we use this um, low level tools to completely influence our circuit and trying to parallelize as much as possible. So we pay the price of having some uh, crosstalk noise uh, but uh, we decided uh, that for our kind of problems, we wanted to minimize as much as possible the overall depth of the circuit that we wanted to run. Uh, so yeah, at this point, I think I've told you everything you need to know about the problem, about the algorithm, about how we run a QPU, and then if you made it up to here, congratulations. Uh, all that is left to do is to actually discuss some of the results that we obtained. So in these three panels uh, that you see here, uh, we show you the results for um, three different instances per data set. Um, on the left, uh, we obtained the actual uh, data instances from, from a US-based uh, website on water distribution systems, where you have loads of interesting examples. Uh, the synthetic, biological, uh, synthetic biology instances we obtained uh, from a NIAP Nature Biotech uh, paper. Uh, where we also got the problem statement from, and we had some massive data set that you can try to sort of uh, implement this problem as well. And finally, for the portfolio optimization task, we uh, went for a cryptocurrency evolution approach, um, where we obtain all this data from a Kaggle, uh, Kaggle data set um, that you can also find uh, kindly offered by this Kaggle user. Now, um, below each one of the instances, what you see is uh, two numbers, the one on the left corresponds to the size of the instance and the one on the right to the average degree of the instance. And before jumping on what the numbers actually tells us, uh, let me also say that we actually decided to run our assets uh, with a single layer. Um, the reason for that, even though it's, it's the, sh the shallowest possible thing you can run on a quantum computer with QAA, is that it is the first time that we're actually running recursive QA, which is a very, very intensive process in the QPU because you need to go live through this whole elimination process. You need to run QA many, many, many times. And in order to ensure that we were as close as possible uh, to the minimal depth in order to run with incoherence times, we decided that this was uh, the, the most uh, potentially successful approach. So hopefully in the future, we get to study um, larger depths. And at the moment, you should take this as a minimal step into exploring the performance of these algorithms. So now uh, let's dive into what the numbers tell us. Um, so here you can see the performance of four different approaches uh, or four different methods. So the first one in orange corresponds to um, uh, just running uh, QAA. The one in red corresponds to adaptive R QAA. Now in blue, uh, we show you the exact solution. And let me say exactly quoting marks, uh, just because um, we use simulating and yielding for these. But given the size of the instances, we are pretty convinced that it is actually the exact solution or very, very close to it. Finally, in green, uh, the fourth line corresponds to just doing random assignments um, over the entire graph, and then averaging over um, five to 10,000 different uh, random, um, uh, yeah, random samples of random assignments. Um, so yeah, uh, as you can see, there's quite a few things to say about the result, but there's two particular insights that I wanna convey to you. Uh, the first one has to do with um, QA performing pretty much similar to a random assignment. So as you can see, just using uh, P equals one QA provides a very similar result to just doing everything at random, which is maybe not the nicest part. However, uh, as you can see, uh, the R QA result is actually much, much better than QA. And in some cases, it even gets really, really close to the actual solution of the problem. And this is the interesting part, really comparing how these two different algorithms perform. So we believe that the reason behind this different performance has to do with the QA having to make an estimate um, from a whole distribution that might contain a uh, contribution uh, from highly excited states, so very suboptimal states, um, and give you a whole cost from, from averaging over all of that. Whereas RQA basically, at the price of having to run multiple QA runs recursively, um, uh, you actually, only extract a little bit of information from each one of these runs. 
meaning that you only need to make a very small guess out of the distribution. And by making small guesses in a recursive manner, you can actually sort of have a better overall guess of what the solution to your optimization problem is. So now just to wrap up uh, all of the results, I wanted to sort of uh, show you a little bit how the optimization curves look like for three different instances that have pretty much a similar size, but varying densities. So let me draw your attention to the left first. And what you see here, it's a graph that looks almost uh, three regular. And I think the nicest part about this is, so here in D, you can see this all the uh, QE optimization throughout the recursive process. And the amazing thing is that it actually, it is optimizing, which is something, which is exactly what you would expect the quantum computer to do, right? But given that it's a noisy intermediate scale quantum device, uh, it is not expected that you're actually gonna see such a nice result. So regardless of how good in the end our metric is, something really nice to take away is that for these cases, even if it's, again, no in intermediate scale, you indeed obtain uh, the optimization process that you expect. Uh, now for the one in the middle, um, is things were actually a lot trickier. And as you can see, for most of the uh, recursive steps, we don't observe a convergence. It's only on the very last step um, where the uh, instance is small enough that we actually get some convergence on it. And the reason for that is that the instance is, is so, so dense that we need to add so many swaps in between, uh, resulting in, in, in having uh, a circuit that goes beyond the coherence times. We still believe that we don't do as bad as QA, uh, simply because um, the choices that we make for the optimal parameters correspond to the best cost that we obtain while exploring the landscape. So finally, uh, real quick, um, for the last case, even though we have an instance that has a very similar average between the first one, we still would observe this convergence and that it has to do uh, with this star-like geometry that you see here. In this case, even though the graph is not as dense, having this special connectivity means that we have to take so many qubits that are far away and having to connect it with this one single node uh, involves having to add many, many, many swaps and in the end makes our circuit quite, quite uh, deep. Again, we believe that the result that we get is actually not that bad and, uh, and that has to do with uh, having picked uh, this set of variational parameters that actually uh, do really well in a specific point uh, within, the, within the landscape. So uh, real quick, that's all I wanted to say within our results. And let me conclude uh, just to summarize what we've discussed here. Basically, um, I've told you about uh, the minimum vertex cover problem. We discussed a few of its applications. We uh, define QA, our recursive QA, and how like its circuit contains the problem instance we want to run. Uh, we discussed how to uh, implement these things uh, on a quantum computer through circuit compilation, which is what we learned the most of. Um, we did not discuss so much uh, on the impact of qubit selection, but I can guarantee you that it's really important that you select the correct set of qubits if you want your results not to be garbage. And as you can see, uh, as, you, as you just saw in some of the results that I shared with you, uh, indeed, uh, optimizing over the QE routing process is actually a very, very important step in order to uh, get meaningful results. And then finally, I think in the end, the really nice thing is that we managed to implement uh, RQA on the quantum hardware. We believe this is one of the first end-to-end -end impl uh, implementations of the algorithm. If you know uh, any yourself, please feel free to reach out and let us know um, uh, because I've not seen any other and I would love to compare our results with um, some other interesting approach. And yeah, so to, uh, to wrap it all up, uh, you can find everything on the blog post. Uh, we're still working on this, we're still performing more experiments and uh, hopefully this all come out on archive within the coming months so you can see all the technical details. And finally, let me say that um, all the tools and tricks that we implemented to carry out this project will soon be available in our uh, open source uh, SDK OpenQA. And I believe that next week our teammate Vishal will give you a demo on, on this amazing piece of software uh, on February 21st, exactly at the same time as the start. And I'm hoping to see many of you using it and getting so many results with QA on recursive QA. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ese. Uh, that was very fun. And I always love when a talk ends with a meme. <laughs> uh, that was very, very fun. Um, also seeing all of the graphs that you have, um, you definitely learn differently when you see everything in a visual manner. Um, Amazing. <laughs> so for everyone in the chat, make sure to keep asking your questions. There's a lot of people watching and a lot of people asking questions and keep it up, keep up the, the questions coming. Uh, for the people who have been asked, uh, active in the chat, there will be a giveaway after we uh, go through the questions for Eze, right? So 
if you're ready to, to win a giveaway, uh, an Amazon gift card, make sure to keep asking questions in the chat. Now, as I have some questions for you myself, um, I, I see that you're a citizen of the world. Uh, you were born in Argentina, in Mendoza, right? You're from Argentina. Yes. Uh, yes. You did your bachelor's in Madrid and Spain and master's in the Netherlands at Utrecht. Yeah. And then PhD in Cambridge in the UK. And now you work in Singapore. Tell us about how it's been living in so many places. Um, I would say it's actually amazing. <laughs> I would definitely recommend anyone that gets the chance to do that to actually go ahead and do it. Um, I think it's a very exciting life experience. It can be a little bit isolating at times, being far from your family, being far from your friends, and actually leaving friends behind every time you hop onto the next place. But that also means you have a family in many different places in the world, and I think uh, it teaches you a lot about how the world works when you get to experience it from many different points of view. Uh, even though the ones I've seen are actually quite narrow, even though these are many different places, um, I think actually only when I moved to Asia or when I moved to Europe from South America is when I've seen the high larger contrast that, uh, yeah, I allow you to have maybe a fair view of how things work or a more interesting point of view, let's say. Yeah, yeah, it's been a, it's been an enjoyable track. Nice, interesting. For sure. Um, hope everybody in the chat, uh, maybe you can say where you're from and. Uh, other people can relate to as well, right? Um, definitely moving to a different country is it's exciting, but also challenging. And uh, yeah. I guess after so many times, maybe it becomes easier, does it? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I think, I think there's a big difference between doing it as a student and doing it uh, for a job. Uh, when you do it as a student, uh, you're definitely bound to meet people by default because you're surrounded by people. Uh, so like you kind of thrown on this massive amount of, of humans around you. So you're pretty much bound to make some friends. Whereas when you move for a job, things can be a little bit different and it takes just a bit of longer to first get acquainted with a place. Um, you have a different set of responsibilities and things to take care of uh, before you can actually start engaging socially with people. But if there's anyone listening who's considering doing an exchange program and you're a student, just go do it. It's going to be one of the most amazing experiences in your life for sure. Uh, hands down, hands down. Um, is that uh, from one of your uh, exchange experiences that you got into dancing? I I was happy to learn that you like dancing. I like dancing myself. What kind um, of dancers <laughs> do you dance? Um, so <laughs> a couple of years ago, I got into hip hop dancing. And it did, indeed, it was uh, through, through one of my exchanges. I actually met uh, another exchange student from Singapore, who is my friend here now. Um, and I you, I guess I just got picked out of the club and said, like, hey, you are an all right dancer. Come dance with us. And I got invited to perform at an event. And I found that I really, really loved it. Um, so even though I was, so I was 22 at the time, which is maybe uh, it, it's in the latest sites to start dancing. Uh, it was still really exciting and I met loads of cool people and I had a lot of fun. I love dancing now. Um, I started doing like hip hop and, and commercial styles, but, uh, but yeah, I've tried many other different things. Um, I still have not done any tango or partner dancing. So at some point I'll have to go back to the South American roots, uh, not to disappoint uh, the family, but yeah, it's been, it's really exciting journey. It's a really, really exciting journey. Nice. And they are yeah. all very different. Knowing how to learn one dance yes. doesn't mean that you can dance the other one. Um, uh, Absolutely. <laughs> tango, for instance, for me, is very hard. It's uh, You have to be very precise in your movements. Yes, 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 yes. It's actually, I would say that partner dancing and just dancing on your own is just a very different philosophy, right? Um, especially if you want to like fully express. Uh, it's a, it's a, I think it's a very different thing when you're sort of on your own, on your head, sort of uh, expressing how you feel the music. Uh, versus when you have like someone just next to you, you need to coordinate and you sort of need to interact and, and get yourself, get each other in the same mood and, and manage to like, yeah, yeah, navigate the music in this very precise way, as you say. And tango for that thing is very, very special. Yeah. Um, very picky, I would say. Maybe one last question for me before we go to the audience questions. 
uh, tell me about this new paper of yours about non-reciprocal light matter interactions. Can you talk about it? Uh, that's a very beautiful question because it just came out today on Archive, and I'm really, really happy about it. This is this has nothing to do with quantum computing. Actually, it's a lot more based on on light matter systems and classical dynamics. If you are all curious, please go ahead. It just came out of Archive. You can find it on the quantum physics. Um, um, folder <laughs> and yeah basically this this was an extension of a project of my last project my phd uh, but i only started working on it like m one year after right before i knew i was coming to singapore and it kind of became like a side project to work on during the evenings and it was just a fun thing that i wanted to share with my phd supervisors and one other one of my colleagues and they kind of got a little bit more excited and it kind of kept going through and i don't know i always thought that it was going to be one of those things that you know, you start and then it kind of stays there, but just never get completed. But uh, yeah, we pushed through and then we managed. And for me, it was very, very special given that now my nine to five is actually working at Entropica. And then going back home and still feeling that I'm connected to the research that I enjoy uh, in topics that are not related with quantum computing uh, made it really cool. And non-reciprocal dynamics, uh, it's a very cool emerging field, especially in classical dynamics. Uh, that it's actually really awesome to see what happens in physics when you forget about uh, Newton's third law. Um, so I encourage all of you to go check that paper, but also another one on non-reciprocal phase transitions for all of you that are still excited about physics. Um, it's an amazing topic. Yeah, everybody wants to learn more. And Hitesh Naval, for instance, asks if you could recommend any references to enhance on the topic you presented today. So if you have any, maybe uh, tomorrow, we know it's very late right now in Singapore, but tomorrow we can go to the Discord and everybody can keep asking your questions in the Discord. And Essay will answer Amazing. them tomorrow. Um, and there you can maybe actually add links to further references and the new paper that just came out. Amazing, um, amazing. Let's continue with the questions from the chat. So uh, Juan Camilo 3148 asks, uh, can these algorithms be applied for chemistry problems? Um, I would say not that I know. Um, so you should think that these algorithms, so the precise answer would be that these algorithms can be applied uh, to your cubo problems. So if whatever problem you have, regardless of where it comes from, you can recast it as a Hamiltonian that has the form that I showed at the beginning. Um, the answer is yes. So basically you have linear and quadratic terms in terms of sigma z, uh, then, then you can use QA and RQA. But I am unaware whether uh, there are quantum chemistry problems that actually can be casted in that specific form. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Um... Broken Symmetries asks, I never understood how to choose the prefactors A and B in this case. For these optimization problems, is there a systematic way to do it? Uh, not that I know of, and that's a really good question because we actually had to think about it quite a bit. Um, yeah, there's, there's certain freedom on that. Uh, I would say the following. You really want to pick, uh, for us, what works best was to pick uh, I think we pick B equals one and A equals 10. Uh, the reason for that is that we really, really, really want to make sure that the answers that we got were actual vertex covers. And also, given that you have a sort of freedom on that, you also want to make your life easier. Um, and if you now go back to how the QA ansatz looks like, um, you can actually uh, pick the values of A and B such that you make uh, this uh, variation of landscape symmetric meaning that you can make sure that you vary your gamma from 0 to 2 pi uh, instead of from 0 to some other random number that will depend on the specific values of A that you choose. So I would say choosing A larger than B, uh, perhaps a bit, you can make it just a bit larger to ensure that we let you find a cover and, and choose the precise value. Maybe that it's an, an even number, I would say, such that um, your curated landscape is as symmetric as possible. Yeah. That's that's super cool. Very useful to learn these tips and tricks. Uh, I mean, I guess others will um, have to try them out, right? Try them out and explore uh, how these work. For Absolutely. You. Very. Please very use OpenQA for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, have to do more research. Uh, we have a question yeah. from Sai Ganesh Manda. How well do these algorithms scale scale up to many quantum systems? 
Um, how do they scale up? I'm I'm hoping that the question has to do with system size. Um, uh, yeah, like what constraints, uh, like number of qubits, can limit the performance. Well, if if one is thinking in terms of devices, I would say that uh, a priori has it has more to do with with the depth of the circuit that you choose. Um, so, for example, if you choose P equals one, I mean, but the problem is it's has to do more with the with the specs of your qubit uh, of your quantum device. So, if you have large enough coherence times and a good enough connectivity, then then in principle you can run the system as large as you want. Of course, the larger it is, the more complicated the geometry can get, right? the more uh, swaps that you'll need to add in between, and then as a result, you have a larger circuit. But if your device is able to operate uh, um, within coherence time for such a depth, then, then intrinsically the number of qubits is not a problem. It's really the connectivity and the coherence times of your device. Okay, interesting. Um... Okay, we have a question, and this will be our last question, but you can keep answering your questions. If your question wasn't answered here, you can go to the Discord. So definitely go to qhack.ai and register. You'll find a button that says, join the discussion. That will lead you to the Discord uh, for everyone. So our last question for today from zayada 11 a uh, Do any of these solutions take advantage of the time series nature of the data? No. No, no, no. Um, I think if, if the question goes along the lines uh, of of the marker graph problem, where we computed the correlations over a period of time, I would say no, because uh, we are really. Um, wait, maybe maybe can you repeat the question again, just to ensure that. I... Yeah, just uh, if you take advantage of the time series nature of the data, say I guess if you have portfolio optimization or something like that, there's. Yeah, no, time. I would say. I would say no because this, I think that this is the rougher, uh, rougher, the roughest possible way of, of treating the data. In the end, you're just squashing all the time series information into the correlation between uh, these these uh, stocks over a certain period of time. But you're not, um, yeah. I think I think you're not explaining any further properties. I, I I'm not sure if if I'm, I'm I'm answering the question correctly or if I'm understanding the, uh, the question correctly. Uh, please feel free to add more comments in Discord. Um, but I think that'll be the answer to the question. Yeah, I guess uh, Discord is the way to go. Uh, so everyone, thank you so much for your questions. They were excellent. We're now going to a giveaway. So thank you so much, Ezekiel, but everybody else stay uh, stay connected. Thank you, Ese. Thank you very really, much. Really, really glad to have you here.